Welcome to Straight Scripture, No Sugar. This is a Bible series dedicated exclusively to the Word of God. Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy Word is truth. John 17:17, 17, 17. John 8:31 and 2. If you abide in me and abide in my word, then truly you are my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Matthew 7, 24. Anybody who hears these things and does them will be likened to a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the winds came, and the storms blew, and the house stood. So essentially, if you have the truth, you have a foundation, you have a rock that is unmovable and unshakable and you have something solid and true to build your life on as opposed to the shifting sands of human opinion that are constantly moving in a thousand different directions at once. I mean, how can you build your house on sand? Well, that's what human opinion is, and that's why here you're going to get straight scripture, no sugar. You are going to get an absolute that's going to give you a strong foundation to build your life on. So today's topic is the limited life, the limited life. So we live in a world, essentially, that uh, has people believing that there are no limits and there are no boundaries and you can do whatever you want and the world is your oyster and everything is in your hand and you can have the world and everything in it. Well, look at what's going on around us in the world when you have absolutely no limits and no boundaries in your life, guess, guess what? Everything's out of control. And when everything's out of control, it leads to destruction. It leads to destruction, not only eternal destruction, damnation, but temporal destruction. I mean, people's lives are completely ruined, not just in this world and the world beyond, but right here right now their lives are ruined because they can't set any limits and they can't set any boundaries so let's get into the right uh, the first verse here which is from Matthew 7 the Sermon on the Mount <clears throat> enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Matthew 7, verses 13 to 14. The narrow gate, enter by the narrow gate. It's difficult, and you have to look for it. Okay? So it's not just that it's hard and narrow, but you have to look for it. It's outside of yourself. So if you're not looking for that narrow gate, you're on the broad path, right? You're on the broad path, and the broad path is where almost everybody goes. Obviously, this is the path for unbelievers, um, and it leads to destruction. So that's keen insight. This is obviously Jesus Christ himself speaking on the Sermon on the Mount. So broad is the way and wide is the path that leads to destruction. Okay, so if your life doesn't have any limits and doesn't have any boundaries, Jesus himself acknowledges the fact that it leads to destruction. So he's talking about damnation, not only that, but he's also talking about a ruined life. You know, a life without boundaries is a life of ruination. And why is that? Well, because if you don't have the narrow path, if you're not following the narrow path and that difficult path that you have to look for, basically your life is driven by lust by your own uncontrollable urges which will never ever be fulfilled and satisfied and that just leads to a life that is completely out of control so you know Jesus there in Matthew 7 he talks about there's few who find difficult this difficult and narrow way you have to find it well why do you have to find it because it's not within you it's outside of you and Jeremiah verifies the fact let's go to Jeremiah 10 here O Lord I know the way of man is not in himself it is not in man who walks to direct his own steps Jeremiah 10:23. okay we don't know naturally within ourselves you know, what the right path is, you know, how to get to this narrow path, this difficult and narrow path. 
Um, you know, we live in a world where pe people may understand, yeah, life is hard, life is difficult. But it's not only that, it's, you know, the correct path. It's not just difficult, but it's narrow and you have to look for it. And why do we have to look for it? Because it's outside of ourselves. We don't know instinctively through our own fallen human nature. We don't understand what the right way is. And that makes us basically dupes of the world, dupes of the devil. And what does the devil do? He deceives and he misleads. Let's get into the next verse here. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. 1 John 2.16 So I just alluded to this earlier. Okay? Driven by lust. We're driven by lust if we don't know this proper direction, this limited direction. And our lusts, you know, lust, if you look it up in the dictionary, it's an overwhelming urge or an overpowering desire. It's completely out of control. Obviously, it does not know any limits. So if we're not on this narrow path, if we don't know this narrow path, then we're on the broad road, which is driven by lust. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Whatever looks good, I want that. Whatever feels good, I want that. Whatever puffs up my pride, I want that. And lust is never satisfied. It's completely insatiable. So it's just constantly, constantly pushing us for more, 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 quicker, better, faster. I mean, just look around you. That's why you see so many people who are completely out of control. You know, they don't have to be drunks. They don't have to be alcoholics. They don't have to be drug addicts. They don't have to be junkies. Just look at them. Look at their behavior. You know, they can't focus for two seconds. They can't learn anything. They're on their cell phone you know, every nanosecond. They can't put it down. You know, they can't set any limits. They can't set any boundaries. Their heads are in ten different places at once. That's a life that's out of control, that's driven by lust. Driven by lust. Okay, so why are we driven by lust when we're not on this narrow path? Because the devil, the deceiver, basically runs this worldly system of lust. Listen to this one. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. 1 John 5.19 That's the devil. And what is the devil? Who is he? He's a liar. Okay, John 8.44, Jesus talks about it. He is the liar and the father of lies. Okay, the devil is a master liar. So he basically deceives and he misleads. That's how he gets us in his grip. And he comes at us through... The worldly system, which is driven by lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Okay? So we don't know this correct and narrow, limited path in and of ourselves. It's outside of us. We have to look for it. And the way is through God. The way is through Christ. But unless we have that narrow path, unless we're on that narrow and limited path, unless we're looking for it, we're just driven by our own lusts, and they're never satisfied, and they're never, ever, ever enough. <clears throat> okay, so here's an insightful passage from Habakkuk, from the Old Testament. It's describing the wicked person here, in Habakkuk 2. He enlarges his desire as hell, and he is like death, and cannot be satisfied. Habakkuk 2.5. Okay, so that's anybody... Who doesn't know God? He enlarges his desire and he can't be satisfied. Okay, that's, that's describing lust. Lust is never satisfied. Lust just wants more and more and more and more and more. It doesn't know any boundaries. It can't work within boundaries because it's never satisfied. That's why you see people who have lives of abject excess. Excess. You know, they have... <clears throat> You know, all these cars and, and houses and and they have, you know, multiple children, more children than they obviously need. They don't have a goal of raising a family. They're just trying to fill the emptiness because they're driven by lust and it's never, ever enough. So they need more and more and more, quicker, better, faster, and their lives are just a big morass of confusion and clutter because they're never satisfied and, and lust is 
is driving their life. Their life is quote unquote unlimited, driven by the world, which says, you know, you can have everything and you can have the world, and the reality is you can't, and it just destroys your life. The broad path leads to destruction. It's too much, and it's completely out of control, and it's never satisfied. Also, here's another verse from James, talking about somebody who is driven by the world. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways, James 1.8. If you look at people who basically don't know God and aren't on this narrow path, their lives are out of control. They're basically doing too many things at once. They've got all these cars and all these possessions and these houses and these things and all these kids and they don't have any, they can't prioritize their life. They're just in a race to try to keep up with all the stuff and they can't and everything flies apart at the seams. Everything flies apart as a seam, at the seams because too much is never enough for people who don't know God. So here's an insightful uh, verse from Proverbs, Proverbs 22:15. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. Okay, so we're talking about the limited life. Well, a child has no limits. A child doesn't know the difference between what is helpful, what is harmful, what is good, what is evil, what is right, what is wrong. I mean, if you leave a hot burner on the stove, it, child's going to put their hand on that hot burner. If there's a dirty piece of gum in the gutter, they're going to pick it up and stick it in their mouth. You know, they don't know what's good and what's healthy and right and wrong and, and what's harmful. And that's essentially the way uh, people behave who don't know God. They're, they're foolish. They don't have any, any discernment and they're just driven by their lusts. And it's just more and more and more, quicker, better, faster. And it's never satisfied, and it, it leads to destruction. Not just eternal destruction, but temporal destruction. Alright, so here's an interesting uh, verse that, that God um, says to the prophet Jonah, um, who was part of the northern kingdom in the 8th century BC. He had him go preach to this culture of abjectly wicked, rebellious, murderous marauders known as the um, the Ninevites who were part of the Assyrian Empire who invaded uh, the northern kingdom and took it captive in the 8th century BC. They were murderers, they were butchers, these people were abjectly wicked. They would chop up their victims into pieces. I mean, you're talking about evil beyond compare. Here's what he says to the prophet Jonah. Now God wanted Jonah to go to preach to these people, to have them repent. Okay, here's what he said to Jonah in Jonah 4. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand? Okay, Lack of discernment. That's what happens when you're not on the narrow path. You don't have any discernment. It's just trying to fill a void, trying to fill a bottomless pit. And it's just more and more and more, and eventually, obviously, it leads to abject wickedness to the point where, you know, you become a complete murdering psychopath. Now, does everybody get to that point? No, of course not. But that's where things will ultimately go if there aren't any limits and there aren't any boundaries. I mean, think about people in business or in all walks of life who basically can't get enough. They don't know God. They're not on this narrow path and their lives are insatiable. Think about people like Bernie Madoff who basically ruined hundreds upon hundreds of lives because he basically took everybody's money. You know, he couldn't get enough. Money doesn't satisfy. You know, he who loves money will only want more. He who chases after wealth will never be satisfied with his income. Ecclesiastes 5.10, that's King Solomon, the man who had an annual income of 25 tons of gold. He was not satisfied because he wasn't on God's path. He wasn't on that limited, narrow path as Jesus talks about. <clears throat> okay, so how do we? you know, get on that right and narrow path, well, obviously we follow God. We follow His Word. We follow His way. Listen to these two here. Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 118, 105. 
The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Psalm 37, 23. That's the whole point, right? We've got to be on the narrow path. It basically marks our course. It charts our course. But it's a path. It's not a wide open field, right? It's a path, right? Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It's, it's, a, it's a narrow causeway that basically takes you where you need to go. But it's not all things to all people. It's not going in every direction. And it's not wide open like Jesus talks about in Matthew 7, what I started with. Broad is the way and wide is the path. That way leads to destruction, right? You know? But this path, right? Um, Psalm 119, 105, this path is the narrow path, right? Uh, actually, I'm sorry, in Matthew 7, Jesus says it's not a path. That's my mistake. It's Matthew 7, broad is the way, broad is the way, right? And wide is the gate that leads to destruction. It's a way that leads to destruction. It's a way that's wide open. It's not a way that's narrow like this path. Okay, so basically, that's what's going on. It's this narrow, narrow path, and that's what leads us to this limited life, which is a life of fruitfulness, a life of purpose, a life of peace and a life that pleases God and leads to personal fulfillment and satisfaction. Okay, so Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, right? So the steps, one step at a time, one step at a time. Okay, so the other thing you notice about people who aren't on this narrow path is they're in a hurry all the time. You know, they're going a thousand miles an hour. <coughs> <clears throat> and if you're going a thousand miles an hour and your head is in 20 different places at once, what happens? Destruction. Look at the way people drive. That's the perfect object lesson. They're distracted, they're on their phones, they're weaving in and out of traffic, they're speeding, their heads are in 10 places at once, and they end up in the guide rail and they either kill themselves or they kill other people or they end up in the hospital. Destruction. Destruction. Okay, so who do we um, follow as a model for this narrow path? Well, obviously Christ himself, God in the flesh, is the perfect model. Um, the way he lived his life was very, very narrow when he first came to this earth. He, he basically, when he came for the first time, he came to seek and save the lost. He did not come to fix the world. He did not come to correct social injustice. He did not come to stop abject poverty. He did not come to save the starving children. He came to seek and save the lost. He had a very, very fixed and narrow purpose, and he fulfilled that purpose of salvation when he went to the cross. For our sake, he made the man who knew no sin to become sin for us so in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's 2 Corinthians 5.21. So by going to the cross, he paid the penalty for sin, and he became the salvation. He became the salvation for the lost. He gave the lost peace with God. But that was his purpose, to seek and save the lost, not to fix the world. When he comes the second time, he will fix the world when he reigns as sovereign of the world. But that happens in his second coming. That was not the purpose of his first coming. That's the whole point. He had a very limited life. God himself on earth limited himself. And it says in Ephesians, or not Ephesians 2, but Philippians 2, that he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped grasped, but he emptied himself and came in the form of a man, and coming in the form of a, of a man, he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. So at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee, every knee will bow, those that are on heaven, those that are in the earth, and those that are underneath the earth. So that, that was his point. His humiliation is what allowed him to pay the penalty for sin. And, uh, and allowed him to save the lost. But his purpose was very limited and very narrow in his first coming to this earth. So let's get 
into a couple specifics here. Here's what he says in Luke 5. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Okay? So that's that was his purpose. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's Luke 5. Okay, that was after he called Levi, the tax collector, out of the tax office. And then he goes and, and Levi, he's now Matthew, he becomes Matthew after he is converted. But he has this big feast for Jesus and for other tax collectors and quote-unquote sinners. And the religious hypocrites of the time, the Pharisees, call Jesus out and say, what are you, what are you doing having this big feast with these tax collectors and these sinners. And he says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That was his point. I have come to call sinners to repentance, to show them the way. John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way to the Father because he pays the penalty for sin. And that was his point, to call the unrighteous, to call these sinners to the righteous path. Okay, so I'm going to talk about something else that happened to Christ in Matthew 4 during his original temptation in the wilderness at the very beginning of his ministry when he's tempted by Satan. I'm going to talk about how he limited himself here. So obviously, when he's tempted in the wilderness, he resisted the devil. The devil came at him with three temptations. He resisted, and he resisted with Scripture, using the truth to parry lies, the devil. Um, but there's more to it than that. There's a bigger picture here, and I want to point this out. So I'm going to read about Christ's second temptation in Matthew 4, in the wilderness, when Satan comes at him. Alright, so this is the second temptation in the wilderness. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Okay, so what's going on there is Satan is tempting him, right? Just throw yourself off the Temple Mount, you know? Everybody will worship you. The angels will catch you and everybody will worship you. And then you will be God on earth, right? You will have your just place as God on earth. So, Satan basically says, it is written, the angels will catch you and you'll not catch your feet on a stone, right? But he's quoting Psalm 91, but he's twisting the meaning of it. So the meaning of Psalm 91 is about the angels supporting you and taking care of you. It is not about testing God, just like Jesus says. You don't basically um, provoke God. You don't provoke God. The angels are there to help you so you don't stumble. They're there to support you. But you don't provoke God by saying, yeah, I'm going to jump off this cliff, and yeah, you better catch me. No. So Satan was basically twisting the scripture, which is what he does. He's a master liar, right? So he's twisting the scripture, but Jesus comes back and says, it is written, you shall not put the Lord to the test. So he quotes Deuteronomy for the second time. You know, you don't put the Lord to the test. So obviously... Um, Satan is tempting Jesus to set himself up, essentially as the sovereign of the universe, as God on earth, which he is. He's God in the flesh, John 10.30, I and the Father are one. However, when he came to the earth for the first time, the purpose of his life was to seek and save the lost, to not call the righteous, but to call sinners to repentance, okay? So if he sets himself up as God and everybody's worshiping him as God, then how is he going to get his message of the good news out there about seeking and saving the lost and calling sinners to repentance if everybody's worshiping him as God? That was not the purpose of his first visit 
to this earth, right? So obviously, he's going to, re you know, stand up to the devil and reject the devil, but there's a bigger picture, and the bigger picture is the purpose of his life is not to be worshipped as God when he came the first time. It was to call the sinners to seek and save the lost and call the sinners to repentance. You know, when you look at the Gospels, Jesus says over and over, follow me, follow me, obey the commands of God. You know, the purpose of life. What is the purpose of life? What did the scribe ask of him? You know, what is the greatest rule? And he says, love your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Obey God. You know, he says in Matthew 6, he, in Matthew 6, 33, Seek the kingdom and his righteousness, and these things shall be added to you. Seek the kingdom and his righteousness. Seek God's righteousness. You know, Jesus emptied himself. He not, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He was to point the way to God, which is through him, by calling these sinners to repentance. Right? That was the purpose of his life. And if everybody's worshiping him as God during his first incarnation, then that message of reconciliation, calling these sinners to repentance, and that purpose which he fulfilled on the cross by paying the penalty for sin, gets completely lost, doesn't it? It gets completely lost. So that was not his purpose, to fix the world or to be worshipped as God on earth when he came the first time. That'll happen the second time. That was not the purpose of his first visit, and he's well aware of that. He's well aware of that. Um, so, you know, in the third temptation, let's get to the third temptation here. So... Satan tempts Christ again for the third time. And I'm going to read this. Here's the third temptation. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Okay, think about that. So obviously Christ uses Deuteronomy again to parry the temptation of the devil and says, No, you're only going to worship the Lord your God. Him only you shall work, worship. And he says, get away from me, Satan. What does scripture say? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. James 4, 7, right? You resist the devil. That's exactly what Jesus did. And he did it with scripture. But the temptation from Satan is, look, I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. Just bow down and worship me. Okay? So obviously Jesus is going to reject that temptation. But there's a bigger picture here. Jesus will get the kingdoms of the world. It says in Psalm 2 that God will give the Messiah the kingdoms of the world as an inheritance. He's going to get them anyway. He's going to get them anyway. He's going to get the kingdoms of the world when he comes the second time. He's going to rule. He came the first time to call sinners to repentance, to pay the penalty for sin. The second time, he's going to come to rule, and he will get the kingdoms of the world. And when he comes the second time, it's going to be a return to Eden-like conditions. That's when the world is going to be renovated. That is when the curse is going to be reversed. The desert's going to blossom like a rose. When people die at a hundred, they're going to die as children. There's going to be a complete renovation of time and space to the point where the sun has no impact on the world like it does now. People are going to live, you know, when they die as a hundred, they die as a child. Children are going to play in snake pits. The lion is going to lay down with the lamb. There's going to be one language. I mean, it is going to be a return to Eden-like conditions. That's when Jesus will fix the world during his second coming, and he will reign as king from Jerusalem. And there's going to be a water bubbling up, supernatural waters bubbling up from Jerusalem. There's going to be an abundance in the world like there's never been. The desert's going to blossom like a rose. I mean, all of these uh, 
prophecies are in the Old Testament, and I'm not going to get into them now. But the point is the limited life, right? So Jesus knew the first time that he came was to call these sinners to repentance and to not set himself up as God on earth, even though that is in fact what he is. And you hear, you hear him talking about himself in the Gospels, and he refers to himself as the Son of Man, okay? The Son of Man. He does not call himself the Son of God. He is that as well. But he's emphasizing his humanity. He says, the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. He says that in Matthew 18, Luke 19. He emphasizes his humanity because he understands his limited purpose in his first visit to the earth, which is to call these sinners to repentance. Okay? So there's one more example of that um, I want to talk about here in Mark 1. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick. Actually, I'm just going to read it. Let me read it from the Bible here. Well, it's from the Bible, of course, but not from my notes, from the actual book itself. <clears throat> Okay, we're starting at Mark uh, 132. Let's see here. Here we go. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, because uh, for this purpose, I have come forth. So what he's talking about there is his purpose, right? I'm going to the other towns and I'm going to preach there. That's why I've come forth. That was his point, to seek and save the lost. How is he going to seek and save the lost if he's not preaching about the good news, about the path to salvation through him. You know, Paul himself affirms this in Romans 10. How is anybody going to hear without hearing the good news, and how is anybody going to hear it if there's no preacher? So that's why Jesus was preaching. He was pointing the sinners and the lost, right, and the unrighteous to the right path. He was calling the sinners to repentance. He was seeking and saving the lost. And to do that, he had to preach. Okay, so let's back up to the beginning of those verses there in Mark 1.32. So what's going on there? At the end of the Sabbath, he's curing the sick. He's casting out demons. Obviously, Jesus is God. He is, God is compassionate. He's merciful. He cares about the pain and the suffering and the need of others. Tremendous mercy, right? He's casting out the demons. He's curing the sick. So that is obviously part of God's nature, part of Christ's nature. And it says in the scripture, of course, that he banished, basically banished disease from all of Palestine. And he performed so many miracles that the books of the world could not hold all of the things that he did. So he showed tremendous mercy and compassion on the suffering of others. But that was not the primary reason he performed those miracles. The primary reason he performed those miracles was to show that he was the Messiah that Scripture had been promising for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. He was performing all those miracles as proof. Now, the secondary reason, obviously, was to show his mercy and his compassion on the suffering of of others, but the primary reason was to point that he was, in fact, the Messiah. So we get back to the Mark verses here. What happens is, you know, at the end of the day, he basically goes 
to where he rests, and then he gets up hours before dawn to pray. He's drawing his power from God, okay? So he's li living this limited life. He understands his power and his incarnation is coming down from above, coming from God. So he's drawing on God's power before he wakes up. Then Peter, you know, he's called Simon in those verses, comes to him and says, Master, everybody's looking for you. And he says, let's move on to the next town. So I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. Okay? See, he's living a limited life. He understands the point of his first visit, which is to call these sinners to repentance. And in order to do that, he has to preach. He's not here in his first visit to fix the world and solve everybody's problems. In fact, in John 6, um, basically after he's fed the thousands, they come back for breakfast the next morning and he says, he sends them home. He says, the only reason you've come here is because you've eaten of the loaves. You know, a lot of them missed the point. You know, they were looking for a genie in a bottle to provide their needs and to solve their problems. And Jesus was here to call the sinners to repentance. You know, he led this limited life and he understood that his purpose was very limited during his first visit to earth. So he is the perfect model of living this limited, limited life. So obviously, he is the path to this limited life. So how do we basically get on this limited path? Well, we have to confess Christ as Lord, which basically gets into a gospel presentation. All have sinned and all fall short of God's glory. There's not one righteous, not one. There's not one who understands or seeks after God. That's Romans 3.23 followed by Romans 3.10. If you've ever lied, cheated, stolen anything, lusted after somebody's car, house, wife, job, status in this world, you're guilty of sin and we're all guilty of sin. You know, all have sinned and all fall short of God's glory. And the only way we can reconcile ourselves to God and we can achieve peace with God is through the perfect man who knew no sin. And that himself is Jesus Christ. For our sake he made the man who knew no sin to become sin for us. So in him we might become the righteousness of God. What makes us right with God is the perfect sacrifice of the perfect man who knew no sin. That's Jesus Christ. And that's why he says in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. The way that we achieve peace with the Father is through the perfect sacrifice of the man who knew no sin. So if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's Romans 10, 9. So that is what gives us salvation by basically confessing Jesus as Lord. His death on the cross satisfied God's wrath against sin and by raising him from the dead he defeated sin and that gives us peace with God. Not only that of course but that gets us on this limited path. This limited path I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you by my eye. Do not be like the horse or the mule who have no understanding, who will not come without bit or bridle. That's Psalm 32, 8, okay? When we confess Christ as Lord, we are on this narrow path, and we will be on this narrow way that leads to life. That gets back to Matthew 7. Difficult is the way and narrow is the path that leads to life. And there are few who find it. It is outside of ourselves. It comes through Christ. And the way that we get on this path is by confessing Him as Lord. And now, guess what? We have, when we confess Him as Lord, we receive as His gift the Holy Spirit this internal guidance system that keeps us on the right path, right? That keeps us on the right path and keeps us heading along this path of righteousness, this limited life that leads to a purposeful life that is satisfying, fulfilling, and God-honoring.
So thank you for listening to this sermon. This series is called Straight Scripture, No Sugar. There are many, many sermons com covering everything from Genesis to Revelation. Um, obviously that basically take a topical slant on what's going on in the world through the lens of Scripture, through the truth and the straight path of Scripture. And you can watch any of these sermons at the website. It's getbibletruth.com. So I hope that you will watch some of these others for your edification. And for unbelievers, this gives you a chance to confess Christ as Lord for believers. I hope it will be a great source of support and nurturing and edification. So I say thank you for listening. This has been Straight Scripture, No Sugar. My name is John Parisi. God bless you. Amen.